Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Tom Glickert, uh, ITS Georgia president. Wanted to thank everybody for uh, coming out with us today and attending the uh, our, our monthly meeting with an update on the Georgia ports. Uh, special thanks to Chris Novak with the Georgia Ports Authority for joining us to provide an update. Uh, we appreciate your involvement in uh, today's meeting and look forward to hearing what you have uh, coming up on the horizon. Uh, thank you to AECOM for sponsoring the event. I'll let Isaac uh, Wingfield uh, uh, in a few moments here uh, get up and, and speak on their behalf. Uh, but first, we'll give a quick update on ITS Georgia. Uh, membership registration remains open for the 2022 calendar year. Please visit our website to find a link to register on the join page and keep an eye out for a membership email that should be coming out shortly. If you have any questions about uh, registration or run into any problems, uh, please reach out to Stephen Sheffield, our membership committee chair. We got an action-packed March coming up. Our first social will take place on March 3rd at Ormsby's in Atlanta. Uh, no registration re required and look for a email coming out in the next week uh, with some more details. March 23rd, we'll be heading back to Peachtree Corners for a tour of the Curiosity Lab and an update on the V2X live conference that will have just occurred before our arrival. Uh, stay tuned for more information on these upcoming meetings. And uh, just so you all know, sponsorship for, for future meetings uh, is available. So please reach out to Matt Glasser or uh, Natalie Smith Mengelcook uh, if you're interest, interested in sponsoring. This coming November, Atlanta is going to be hosting the Southeastern ITS Summit, which will bring five ITS chapters under one roof. Be a great opportunity to network with your peers from Georgia and the surrounding states, exchange knowledge and demonstrate new and emerging technologies. The call for abstracts has been extended, uh, so please uh, visit the website and will be extended. Uh, so please go ahead and visit the website and uh, get your abstracts in, and uh, don't miss an, don't miss out on an opportunity to present some of the uh, cool things y'all are working on. Uh, there's some upcoming STEM activities that ITS Georgia is helping others promote within the metro Atlanta area. Uh, we'll be promoting these activities through email campaigns and reminders at our monthly meetings. So two upcoming events include the Georgia STEM Day on March 4th and the Atlanta Science Festival between March 10th and the 26th. There's still time to register and get involved with these events uh, and uh, help usher in the next generation of, of engineers. And then finally, ITS Georgia is, is looking for volunteers to help us manage the organization and create meaningful content and connections within the ITS community. If you or anybody you know is interested in getting involved, please reach out to us at info at itsga.org for more details. And please be sure to pass this message along to those who may not uh, be here today or may not be on our mailing list. So with that, I'll pass it over to Isaac with AECOM to give uh, their presentation and introduce Chris. Good afternoon. I appreciate the opportunity for us to uh, present and sponsor this event today. Um, it's a great turnout. I'm really impressed with how many folks came out, especially after all the COVID concerns and everything else. This is really good. Uh, to introduce a little bit of how are the relationship works between AECOM and the Port Authority, AECOM is one of two program managers for Georgia Ports Authority that provides full consulting engineering and construction management services for the port. In the three years that we've been working with GPA as their extension of staff, we've executed over 35 task orders, ranging from simple mill and overlay pavement work, all the way up to planning and design of over 100 acres of new facilities that are being done. Uh, we have a team of 13 folks dedicated in Savannah to service uh, Chris Novak and his engineering team and whatever the, the management needs us to do. That, those 13 folks are his direct connection to the 60,000 employees that AECOM has managing all forms of ITS, simulation work, and whatever comes up. And so I'm going to introduce Mr. Novak now. Mr. Novak is a civil engineer who has worked in the transportation and port in development industry for over 30 years, including servicing as director of engineering at Port Everglades in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and is currently the senior director of engineering and facilities at the Georgia Ports Authority in Savannah, Georgia. He has delivered a multiple array of projects in his career that has included cruise terminals, container yards, 
port warehousing, marine infrastructure, and transportation projects, including the world's first driverless electric car system that is currently operating in Abu Dhabi in the United Arab Emirates. As the Senior Director of Engineering and Facilities at the Georgia Port Authority, Mr. Novak is balancing the delivery of an aggressive capital improvement program that supports the fourth busiest container port in the United States with a, with a sound environmental program that is geared towards preserving the environments and focusing on sustainability. Mr. Novak is a registered engineer in the states of Georgia, Florida, and Tennessee, and holds a bachelor's degree in civil engineering from the University of Miami, where he holds, currently holds several long distance running school records, which he is very proud of. So Mr. Novak. I appreciate that, Isaac. Uh, yeah, Isaac and, and his team are an integral part of what we do at the GPA. Uh, without him and his team, uh, it would be very difficult for me to do what, uh, what I do at the Georgia Ports. Has anybody been down to Savannah and been seen the Georgia Ports Authority at all? A couple folks? Um, okay, so we've got, got a couple folks. Um, what I want to do is, first off, just give you a little uh, overall view. Uh, hopefully, you, you can all hear me with this, with this little tool. Okay. So the Georgia Ports Authority, uh, it, we are responsible for uh, running the state's port, port dock facilities. And uh, the state of Georgia really doesn't have a huge coastline, a little over 100 miles uh, along the coast. Um, but our major facility in Port of Savannah is called Garden City Terminal. We're going to get into that in a second. It's the fourth largest container terminal in the United States and the largest land mass for containers in the U.S. Bigger than L.A. Long Beach, bigger than New York, New Jersey, the biggest facility, single facility in the U.S. So it's a huge asset for the state of Georgia and for what we do here in the southeast. And at the end of the day, we feed so much products up to this Atlanta area that many of the products that you guys are dealing with here up in Atlanta probably made their way up through containers through Savannah uh, up, to, up here up uh, to, uh, to the Atlanta area. Just this photo here, just give you an idea. So that's the Talmadge Bridge down in Savannah. And uh, that's the CMA Roosevelt. Uh, that came to the port uh, last year. And at the time, it was the largest vessel to ever call on the east coast of the United States. Think about that. All the hundreds of years of maritime that has taken place in the world history, that was the largest vessel that ever called on the east coast of the United States. That's about a 16,000, 17,000 TEU vessel. Let me tell you what TEU is. That's our speak for support speak. A TEU stands for 20-foot equivalent unit, a 20-foot box. But when you see the boxes on that, on that ship, that's a 40-foot box. So each box is two TEUs. So you're going to hear me talking about TEUs a lot. How many TEUs are on? So if that's a 16,000 TEU box uh, container, uh, container ship, there's about, you know, there's some 20-footers on there, but there's about eight to 10,000 boxes on that ship. So that vessel got underneath that bridge by about 10 feet. So you could have a broomstick and scrape right underneath the bridge when that vessel went underneath it. Pretty scary. Those pilots are experts in getting these vessels in up the river. Now, you can see everything is kind of like an iceberg. What goes on below it? So you've got 10 containers, 8 to 10 containers above that you can see. Then down below that vessel is another 8 to 10 containers. So it's almost 20 20 containers high is what that vessel, when it's coming in up the Savannah River, and what you can see when it's making its way. So from the port's perspective, it's my job to implement the infrastructure to service a vessel such as that and bigger ones. Bigger ones are coming. And we're working with the Georgia DOT and other stakeholders about finding a solution for that bridge, because believe it or not, that bridge is not high enough. It's 185 feet from the bottom of the water up to the top of that bridge, and that vessel is coming right underneath it. So we need that bridge to be not 185, but 230. That bridge needs to be 45 feet higher than what it is today. Now, where did 230 come from? That is the highest bridge in the Mubarak Bridge in Saudi Arabia in Suez Canal. When you're dealing with container ships like we have here in Georgia, we deal with vessels that make their way through the Panama Canal, and the Suez Canal. Both ways, they make their way. Just to give you an idea. So a vessel that leaves China with containers of uh, TVs, whatever else, makes its way through the Suez Canal, 
probably goes to New York, goes to Virginia, goes to Savannah, and makes its way back. So it's almost a six-week circuit when it goes through the Suez Canal, and then kind of the other way around, when, you come, when it comes to the other side of the world, through the Panama Canal, it'll go to Savannah first, Virginia, and New York, and make their way off. So why am I saying New York, Virginia, and Savannah? At the end of the day, those are the gateway ports for the East Coast of the United States. That's where all the big containers, that's where all the big distribution centers are. It's kind of an un, unwritten rule, and people don't realize it, but Savannah is the, the hottest warehouse facility building construction in the United States. We have millions of square feet of warehouses under construction at that in Savannah right now because of what we do at the port. So when I go over some of this stuff, you're gonna see what, what we do and from a transportation and logistics perspective, we're just the beginning part of the funnel. And when that ship comes to the port, unloads its containers and off it goes into these warehouses, makes its way up to Atlanta, Memphis, Chicago. Some of our containers make it up to Chicago. So I'm gonna get into some of that so you can understand the logistics and what takes place from a port's perspective to get all this stuff that you have out here on your tables uh, on, a, on a very quick basis. And by the way, you've heard everything that you hear about in the news, don't believe everything you hear in the news. However, I will tell you this, of all the ports in the United States as of last month, all of them, LA, Long Beach, Oakland, New York, New Jersey, Virginia, Miami, all of them had vessels sitting out on anchor waiting. Savannah was the only one that had no vessels. The only one, zero. We like to use our stuff. We need to get our stuff in. And I'm gonna tell you how we do that with, the, with, with some of these slides. So just uh, from an introductory perspective, we all know the state of Georgia. Savannah is where our, where, where our big facilities are. We have a car facility down in Brunswick. The, one of the largest car import export facilities for vehicles takes place in Brunswick. I'll show you a, a, just a quick snapshot of that. Mercedes, Jaguars, Kias, all make their way in our Brunswick facility. We're gonna talk about ARP, which is the Appalachian Regional Port. That's it gets you into a little bit of the inland port uh, business that we do here at the, at, the, at the Georgia ports as well. And Bainbridge is a smaller uh, river port that we had. We haven't had a vessel there, but it's basically a transshipment facility now for our farming uh, partners out there, out in that part of the state. So just from a numbers perspective, 500,000 jobs supported by us. You know, 1 .122 billion in sales, 29 billion in income, just big numbers. You know, we are a big component of the state of Georgia in the Southeast. And that's what we thrive on. That's why we wanna be an asset for what takes place in the state of Georgia and beyond. We are run by a board of 13 members. Those 13 board members are selected by the governor. So technically we are the Georgia Ports Authority, but those 13 board members came from the governor and we report, I obtain all approvals for all what you're gonna see through our board. So it kind of gives you an idea of the operations of what takes place. We run the port like a business. Not a single dollar comes from Georgia taxpayers that goes into the Georgia ports. Every single dollar that we obtain from our customers from these shipping lines, we put right back into our facilities. So this is not, it's called it, where I came from in Florida, it was called an enterprise fund. This is basically a private, entity that utilizes funds that we generate, we put right back into our assets, into our facilities to allow us to grow and for our economy to grow here in the state of Georgia. So from a Savannah's perspective, so we basically have two major ports. Garden City is what we're gonna focus a lot on today. Garden City is that largest terminal in the United States. Ocean Terminal is a little bit further down the river. So just give you a health perspective. To the right side, that's where the Atlantic Ocean is. Come on up about 16, 17 miles up the Savannah River. That's where you get to these terminals. So these terminals, downtown Savannah is just to the right of Ocean Terminal. So, so when General Oglethorpe made his way up here in the 1600s, the guy had some vision. He made his way up. He set up downtown Savannah on these knolls and the ports were past downtown. So it allowed the vessels to come from the, or now the vessels make their way from the ocean they pass the tourists from downtown Savannah and make their way up to Garden City. And they were able to access that terminal from highways very, very quickly, highway and rail. And I'm gonna tell you, that's one of the main reasons why there's no ships outside Tybee, because we can get these boxes in and out very, very quickly. Can't do that in LA Long Beach. So Garden City Terminal, let's just talk about it real quickly. Uh, 1,350 acres. Dedicated container terminal, I've got some better photos. I'll show you, gives you an idea what goes on. 
Uh, berths, it's got two miles of berths that make up nine berths. So nine vessels of different sizes can be along the river. We've got some warehouse facility, but at the end of the day, it's all about our equipment. All along that river, we've got 30 gantry cranes. We're gonna get six more shortly, it'll be 36. Ultimately, there will be 39 there in the near future. We've got rubber tire gantry cranes all throughout the terminal. I'll explain to you that in a second. As well as two on-terminal rail uh, companies, NS, uh, and Norfolk Southern and CSX, operate in this terminal. One of the few ports in the United States has, has both class one railroads operating in that terminal. What does that do? That allows us to get all these boxes in and out of here quickly. So it gets to Best Buy, Home Depot. They all have distribution centers all in Savannah. Huge Amazon facilities about ready to open uh, in Savannah. We are feeding all of that cargo to these facilities. So Ocean Terminal, another smaller facility, about 200 acres. The reason why I'm showing you this is it currently is an existing facility that's, I call it jack of all trades facility. Got some containers, we've got some rubber uh, containers, some boxes, cars go through there. We're about to do a major transformation of that terminal. It's going to become all containers, but I'll show that to you in a second. It's part of our expansion. Going down to Brunswick Terminal, so Colonel's Island is that larger facility. That's about a uh, about 2,000 acre facility. It's nothing but cars. And then two smaller ports, Mayor's Point and East River, are small break bulk facilities that we handle fertilizers and that kind of that kind of products, but. Majority of the business that takes place down in Colonel's Island is the cars. But from a car's perspective, what's important about this is more than half of that facility still remains to be built. Many, many car facilities throughout the United States don't have this kind of capacity. We've got the room to grow, and we are already number one as an import-export vehicle. Just imagine when we continue to expand it and allow us to put additional car facilities out there, that it'll become even a greater facility and the reason why that growth is there is because we're in the Southeast US. Now, I, I was born in New Jersey, but you know, I moved, I migrated in the 70s, like a lot of folks. So I consider myself a Southerner, but most folks are retiring down in the South. Like, it's warm. That's why all of our facilities continue to grow. That's why the Southeast continues to grow is because the population center is moving down our way. That's why even during COVID, our facilities and our volumes were record volumes. When, vo when vo COVID first came on, we thought, oh no, what's gonna happen to our volumes? We're gonna tank. It tanked for about two weeks because then people started saying, you know what? I'm gonna go to Home Depot. I'm gonna go to Best Buy. I'm gonna do improvements to my house. And they didn't go to restaurants. They didn't go on vacation. They started buying stuff. What does buying stuff do? Container business starts thriving. My boss, Griff Lynch, he's the CEO of the Georgia Ports Authority. He's doing our state of the port tomorrow. Hopefully you'll see, maybe you can see it on YouTube in a, in a few days. But he's going to talk about how we had 10, 15, 20% increase in volume. We're seeing volumes today that I wasn't planning for another three or four years. So what does that mean? That means I put a lot of pressure on guys like Isaac. Because Isaac and his team has to build and design all of these facilities for us so we've got the capacity to handle all these containers. It's all about capacity, and that's what we're going to talk about uh, in the next couple of, couple of slides. So rail facilities. You hear about how what's going on in the, in the world with the trucking business and the shortage of truckers, and we kind of knew that was going to, could possibly happen in the near future. So we began reviewing the installation of inland ports. Well, Garden City Terminals down there in Savannah We've got Norfolk Southern and CSX down there. We want to connect them up to facilities north of Atlanta so you guys aren't battling that truck traffic here in Atlanta. It's bypassing Atlanta on rail, making its way into these smaller inland ports and then up into the, up into the southeast of the US. So that was our theory. We've already constructed the Appalachian Regional Port. Well, what does that look like? Pretty cool facility up in the mountains. I never thought I'd be building a rail, a port rail facility in the mountains. But basically all it is, is you can see, CSX tracks, CSX rail, comes directly in, unloads boxes. Those boxes are placed on our property. Those are, rail mount, or those are rubber tire gantry cranes. Those cranes put them on trucks and off they go to the carpet business, the flooring business, everything that's taking place up in, the north, in Northwest Georgia. So that was currently built. That's been, that's been operating for about two and a half years. The one that is located, uh, let's see if I can go backwards again. 
Northeast Georgia, that is out for bid as we speak. I'm gonna begin building that one. It's in Gainesville, Georgia. That will start construction in about three or four months. That one's gonna be even more complicated than the Appalachian Region Report because the Northeast Georgia one's a little bit mountainy. A poor guy working in mountains. You'd think that doesn't really work out very well, but we've got good partners like Isaac and Moffat and Nickel and, and AECOM. Those guys help us design these facilities so that we can deliver them and have these connections to North Georgia that you probably didn't even realize that you had that connection from Savannah with the, from a rail connection. So, all right, let's talk Port 101 Garden City Terminal so that you guys understand what the heck goes on. So here's a, the aerial photo of Garden City Terminal. I always look at it as three components. Number one is the waterfront. That's the discharge, that's the component from ship to land. Major infrastructure is required along the waterfront. That's, that's lesson number one. Lesson number two, the container yard. Once those boxes come off the vessel, they've gotta be placed in the container yard and they sit in their boxes and they wait for Home Depot or their truck guys to come and pick up their box and take it off to their warehouse. And then the third component of it is support areas, rail yards. U.S. Customs got a warehouse that they ch check their boxes in these facilities. These are all support facilities that we need on our port that gets those boxes in and out of here quickly. So all of the infrastructure necessary to support all of that is my responsibility, Isaac's responsibility, and our program managers to get all this stuff done. So waterfront, well, you think, oh, can't be that big, right? We've got, we're gonna have 39 of these animals. So that's a ship to shore crane. That crane right there, $17 million. So 39 of those things, you're getting near a half billion dollars just in ship to shore cranes. There's a guy that, 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 that's on the top of that boom and he goes down in there and pull, picks up the box, sticks it down in, onto a truck down, down waiting. They can move about 30 to 35 boxes an hour from that ship to shore crane. So a vessel may have five cranes on it. So five times 35, Kind of easy to do the math. Was that 175, 180 crane, uh, boxes an hour? 180, they got 2,000 boxes. That vessel's sitting there for 10 hours and it's in and out. The quicker they're in and they're out, the better. So we've got to have fast equipment. These Coney cranes are the best pieces of equipment in the world. Their, their brains and mechanical electrical components are built in Finland. The steel structure is built in China. They put those five cranes on a ship, they float it, from China to Savannah, we roll them off onto the dock and we commission them and get them ready. Part of $17 million a piece. They are on rails as well. So there's infrastructure for the rail facilities and the construction of the docks for that operation to take place. In addition, they're electric. They're not diesel. Those are, you can see the, the large uh, uh, spool on the, on the side of the crane. That's basically the, the extension cord that provides the power to these ship to shore cranes. So, from a power's perspective, you might think, hmm, Georgia Power, oh, I'm sure Atlanta Hartsfield Airport, that must be the biggest power user in the, in the state of Georgia. No, nope. Georgia Ports. I pay the power bill. I can tell you how much the power bill is every month for our facilities, $500,000. That's a lot, of, a lot of coin, just for power. The ship to shore cranes, they make up about 30 to 40% of that power bill. The other remaining component of that power bill is, is I've got connections for, okay, now this is not a funny word, I'm not being a wise guy, a reefer container. A reefer is a refrigerated container, not one of these. It's a reef, you know, a refrigerated container. We have to provide power to keep the uh, refrigeration on many of the containers. Shrimp, fish, fruits, all that come from the US or from other areas. You gotta have refrigeration units as well. That's support infrastructure that I showed you on that one slide. You've gotta have all this infrastructure to be able to handle these containers that make their way out. So that's just the, the waterfront. Let's look at the container side. So that's a large aerial photo. Look at all those rubber tire gantry cranes, 178 of them. I'm about to buy another 30. They're about two and a half million dollars a piece. So if you've got 200 of them, there's another $500 million just in cranes that move boxes. So when that box comes off the ship, the, the trucker drives it into the stack, that RTG picks up the box, sticks it in the stack, 
We wait to hear from Home Depot, hey, we want to come pick up our box. They send a trucker a day or two later. The trucker comes in, the RTG finds where that box is, picks it up, and off he goes. Now, here's a very, very important component. You guys are all smart folks, intelligent transportation society. From my group, thank goodness I got Isaac and his team. So I have a total of, for all of our facilities, I have a total of four engineers in my group, and I have AECOM and Moffitt. So we add up those guys, so they, they do all, they help, we do all the infrastructure. But I sure would hate to lose a box in there. There's a lot of boxes. We have upwards of 80,000 boxes at any one time in that terminal. We need to know where exactly every one of those boxes is because customer A is gonna say, where's my container, when am I gonna get it? So we have a huge IT component, about 50 to 60 folks that do all the software and hardware that track where every one of these boxes is. We haven't lost a box yet. Because we cannot lose a box. Because every single box is important to that customer and we've gotta make sure that we know where it is we know its transfer, where it takes place, whether it's on the ship, it's on the ship to shore crane, or if it's in its yard. And then finally, it moves into a support zone, and there's, there's one of our rail facilities. We're gonna talk about the mega rail facility in a second, but that's a $220 million rail facility that was specifically built for Norfolk Southern and for CSX to move boxes onto trains to Atlanta and beyond quicker. We are the only port that can take a box put it on a train and get it north of Atlanta less than 24 hours. Sometimes that box is on the train and making its way up towards Atlanta and the ship is still at the dock. That's logistics. You've got to have the intelligence logistics to be able to move containers that quickly, that fast, to make sure that there's no ships outside Tybee. And you get Fox News and CNN wondering why you guys can't get these boxes out of here quicker. We know that you gotta get this stuff out of here very, very fast. Without having the infrastructure to support it, there's no way we can do it. So now, I'm not gonna give you a test in Port 101, but I'm, I know you guys would pass it, because you've seen what are the most three important components of it. But the most important piece, if you remember any slide today, now that's a very nerdy looking slide, but this slide right here is really how I plan what needs to be done at the GPA. You can see it's a 10 year time frame. The total 10-year capital, $3.27 billion is what I'm gonna be spending in the next 10 years. We're gonna take out some bond money, I need to borrow a little credit card. But the previous 10 years, I've been here 10 years as of last month, I've spent 1.53 billion. So I need to do twice of what I've done. We can do it with, with partners such as Isaac. But the green line is the projected volume of what we think we're gonna need in the next 10 years. That green line is established by economies, economists, smart people that understand you know, the business side. I, I hate business classes. But they're the ones that project the volumes of what we think we're gonna need. I need to make sure that we have the dock facilities and the yard facility to handle the volumes that take place. So right now we're at about 6 million TEUs. We expect by 2032, it's gonna be approaching eight and a half million. So I've gotta make sure that we've got enough construction projects going that increases the capacity of the yard and docks. Because if you don't increase those capacities, you're gonna be LA Long Beach. Those boxes are gonna sit and those ships are gonna sit. We cannot do that here in Georgia. It's our job to make sure that we are aggressive with our capital program that we continue to invest to all these construction projects that increases the berth capacity and the yard capacity. Now we've got these smart guys that do a dynamic simulation and they tell me what the capacity is if you add this improvement. That's gonna give you another million TEUs of capacity. What if you do this, this is gonna give you another half million TEU capacity. That's how we review how much that yard can handle. It's pretty simple elementary when you think about it, but can get very, very complex when you're trying to get it all done designed properly, delivered, and oh, by the way, when you got 20% increase that you weren't expecting because of COVID, when I was only expecting maybe three or 4%. So we've got to be very, very aggressive with the implementation of our program. Currently, and this is an ugly table, but at the end of the day, that, that's a table that I give to my boss every, every other week, just a listing of 
an update of projects that are ongoing. So today, as we speak right now, I have $724 million in contracts for equipment, development of our property, and all of our infrastructure to be able to, 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 be able to increase the capacity. So let's just put that in our back mind. $724 million is under construction as we speak. But I need to continue going up because that green line is increasing. So I need more stuff. So we move forward with a lot of those projects. You saw those steps in that graph. One of them was a birth one realignment. It's a project that we knew, if you can see up in that top area on the down river side, or there's a little kink in the dock. What that kink does is it prevents me from putting a big vessel in that dock, in that part of the dock. So we came up with a project. It's currently on, this is a photo taken two weeks ago. We're basically realigning the dock. We've we cut it out and we're realigning it to make it all fully straight. That allows me to put larger vessels in birth CB1, container birth one, two, and three. Larger vessels, more containers, higher capacity. And oh, by the way, when that berth gets done, the largest ship to shore cranes on the East Coast of the United States will be operating there. There are gonna be six of them gonna be delivered. And those ship to shore cranes will have a lift height of 165 feet, our current ones are 152. So think about this, you're the guy in that operating seat and he's 165 feet up, going down with his little uh, container, uh, uh, let's call it, let's be technical here, it's a, it basically lifts up the container out of the vessel, moves it, and it's 165 feet down onto a platform about this big for a truck. Pretty darn impressive that those folks can do it. They are the MVPs of the GPA, those operators of the, of the cranes. They're able to move, remember I said, 35 an hour. So down it goes, up again, he goes and gets another one, 35 times an hour while he's at, in this operating to, uh, mode, moving those containers out of that ship to shore crane. My job is to make sure that his job is easier. How much do you think I spend on that guy's chair? $80,000 a chair, just in that crane. $80,000, it's gotta be ergonomically correct. You gotta have the proper control components so that that person can operate easily and move those boxes without going through pain. It's a pretty expensive chair. So that's just one project that's gonna increase our birth capacity by 1.4 million TUs. That allows us to put bigger vessels there. So here's Garden City. This can give you an idea of a planning perspective of what we try to do. So Garden City Terminal is in that gray. The purple is a piece of property owned by Louis Dreyfus Sugar. The yellow is a piece of property owned by Georgia Atlantic Port. That used to be a facility where they used to soak power poles with creosote nasty oil nastiness so they don't corrode. It's gone now, but it was the most contaminated piece of property I've ever been on. Then the pre in the orange, is basically GPA property. So we wanted to connect up the GPA property somehow so that can expand our capacity. So a lot of planning had to take place in trying to determine how we can get some of these properties to connect up to Garden City Terminal. So I'm going through this exercise so you can see all oh, that, that, that's what these guys do from a planning perspective. So just looking at it up front, there's Louis Dreyfus, there's the gap. Georgia Power's got a big, big easement they've donated some of their other property to us. It was called Plant Craft. It was an old coal fired uh, power plant. They donated it, they cleaned it up, they gave it to us. I love free land, but no land is ever free. We need to make sure they can handle a facility that we want to construct. And currently what's under construction is a warehouse facility, a transshipment warehouse that will accept 40 foot containers from Garden City Terminal. It goes into that warehouse, they take all the crap out, they put it on the ground, and then stuff from Home Depot goes into this 53-footer, this stuff from Best Buy goes into that 53-footer, and then the 53-foot trucks head on out to their destinations. It's a logistics component to break down a 40-foot container. Adjacent to it is also going to be a road system that connects up Garden City Terminal through to connect up to them. So it's a link that links up our facility to that terminal. Isaac's doing the design of that road now, and he's, he's loving it. So it creates a facility that gives us another 500,000 TUs of capacity of yard. Remember, that's it, capacity, that's what we want. So that provides us to us. So as of today, that is the building pad of the 300,000 square foot uh, warehouse. 
It's under construction. You guys may think, man, man, you guys are getting this stuff done quickly. Well, there's a little trick at the GPA. I love this trick. I, prior to that, as Isaac had mentioned, I was down in Florida. I was the, the port engineer for Port Everglades. Port Everglades was part of three separate cities, city of Hollywood, Dania Beach, and Fort Lauderdale. If I ever wanted to build something, I would have to go to either the city of Fort Lauderdale and get a building permit, or uh, Dania Beach, blah, blah, blah. So I had to teach these city, the city engineers about port engineering. I came to GPA in 1945 when GPA was established. There was language in there that said the senior director of engineering of the Georgia Ports Authority is the chief building official of property that's owned by the GPA. So when I went to move forward with that, I make sure it's built in accordance with the National Building Code. My friend Isaac and his team make sure that that's the case. I give myself a permit. <laughs> Build it. Get it going. Make sure it gets built. Now, that's a nice advantage that we take very, very seriously because if you don't do it right, you could lose that advantage. Most ports don't have that advantage, but that allows us to get things done quickly. The only permits I typically really have to get is when I have to mess in the, in the river with the feds. And if I mess around with wetlands, it's got to go to the core. But typically, building permits and all that comes through, through my office. I've never given myself an NOV yet. So we've been, we've been pretty lucky. So that currently is under construction. Uh, it will be done later this year. It gives us more yard capacity. So I'm explaining to you all the planning that's taking place so we understand different things that gives us more capacity. These are just a couple of projects that are going to be, we're modifying areas in the yard that gives us more capacity. Uh, currently, a big chunk is under construction. I'm basically creating more paved areas for us to stack containers. Isaac had mentioned a big project that they're working on. This is a property that we own, that we purchased from PCS Nitrogen. Not the cleanest folks around. But we were able to get their property, about 150 acres. And we're now currently, phase one is about to be delivered. That was a small area that uh, provides us some storage area for some support. But the real cojones is a 100 acre additional expansion of Garden City Terminal. It's gonna have 30 rail, uh, rubber tire gantry cranes. It's connected directly to Garden City Terminal. This gives us a million TEUs of storage capacity. This needs to be done when birth one gets done. Because when birth one gets done, that gives me a million TEUs of capacity at the dock, and I need a million TEUs of capacity in the yard to handle this additional business. That's gonna get done. Thank goodness that Isaac and his team are gonna have bids very soon, and we'll be going to the board in March. So that's a huge component, but the manning of planning, what do we spend, two and a half years on this thing, Isaac? He's been living and loving it. Two and a half, three years of getting it moved forward, I mean, it, the, the sketch doesn't do it justice. We've got to go to the road on the right. That's a GDOT, uh, or, uh, State Road 307. We've got to put a signal there. We've got gates and all construction needs to be built so that becomes part of the secure zone. All our port is in a secure zone called TWIC, Transportation Workers Identification Card is required by all folks that go in there. So this is a secure zone that requires and provides us additional capacity for, for our terminal. Another project here. This is on the back side of that CB1. So you can notice there's some support area. There's a warehouse there. Boy, I would sure love to see, like here's the cartoon of it. There's a bunch of stuff down on the bottom, some cleaning areas or clean boxes. How good would that be if it, boom, it became RTG rows? More capacity. Well, we can do it. We're working on it. It's being designed as we speak, but it requires the relocation of some buildings. And those buildings will be relocated to other property that we own. And it's going to create a campus version for us. So it's a win-win. We need -win. additional capacity in the yard, new facilities for our folks. We have about 1,500 employees. It's probably going to increase to 2,000 in the next two, three years. So we need to make sure we have the space for all of our employees. So we try to make it a win-win as we move forward with some of these projects. So let's talk about a big project that, uh, well, this was a tough one. Mason Mega Rail. Currently, the project had two rail yard facilities in Garden City. To the right was the CSX yard. To the left down here was the Norfolk Southern yard. We felt that we can connect them together to create one mega rail terminal. Because Norfolk Southern, I'm going to get down here a little bit. Norfolk Southern, they'd pull in trains. They'd come in through here, and oh, they'd build their trains through that neighborhood. Not exactly my kind of place to live. 
having trains being built in your neighborhood, intersections closed, six intersections closed as they moved their trains back and forth, back and forth. So we needed to come up with a solution that those trains would be built on Garden City Terminal and not in the neighborhoods. The feds love that idea. So the first, it's called Fastlane at the time, uh, three, four years ago, we submitted a, a grant application that basically requests that the yard, that both facilities be connected and we remove the train tracks in the neighborhood. This is a win-win all around. We were able to close off intersections in the neighborhood. We we're able to build 10,000 foot trains on our terminal. It creates a consolidated facility for both CSX and Norfolk Southern so we can increase our capacity of rail lifts. That's exactly what this project did. So there were a lot of components to it. A lot of stuff made me very, very, uh, kept me awake at night. Three rail bridges need to be built, two over vehicle overpasses. We combined both rails. We rerouted the major drainage canal called Pipe Makers Canal, which drained 25,000 acres of property in Chatham County. They want, we had to reroute that properly. 18 working tracks, 10 rail mounted gantry cranes, and a partridge in a pear tree. It created 2 million TUs of capacity for rail for $220 million. Big, big project. Almost complete. That's what it looked like uh, when it first started. You can see that's just Norfolk Southern's yard. Today, right now, we've got some rail mounted cranes are up in there. They'll be fully completed by September. So that provides us with the capacity necessary from a rail perspective, and it gives us exactly what we need. The project is 80% complete. We've got those large, blue, beautiful looking rail mounted cranes. 18 working tracks, Norfolk Southern is on the right, CSX is on the left, and by the way, getting those two guys to work together, like cats and dogs. They are not easy. And they were a little bit nervous about being in the same footprint with each other, but we were able to work together with them because it's our property and you guys are our partners. We need to work together to get all this work done. Right now, it's very, very close to being completed. So next time you come down to Savannah, hopefully you can get a chance to take a look at it. If you go over the 307 overpass, in fact, this property here is the property that Isaac's about to do. He's, he's doing that. So that connects up adjacent to the rail facility. So let's talk about some more capacity. We need to come up with a big capacity increase. So that, remember I mentioned Ocean Terminal. Ocean Terminal is an existing facility. You can see we've got this old slip. There hasn't been a ship in that slip in, for decades. It's basically kind of a mod podge of a container terminal. It's got a couple warehouses. Uh, we just built in the upper left-hand corner a $45 million project for containers. We thought, hmm, we need more container capacity. Let's move some of this business down to Brunswick and modify Ocean Terminal to become a container terminal. <sighs> Easy, right? 2006, 26, my boss said, Chris, get it done. We've got to, for those vessels, for a larger vessel to be built, we've got to dig into our property to allow those vessels to be berthed along the dock because they can't go out into the river and cause more of an obstruction for the pilots. So for these larger 16 to 18,000 TU vessels to come in, we pull in onto the property. You'll notice all the warehouses are gone. The slip's been filled in. We've got RTG rows, very similar to the Garden City model. Without that, we wouldn't be able to increase capacity. This gives us almost 2 million TUs of capacity. Remember I told you I wanted to get from six to eight and a half. This one gives us the yard capacity and the berth capacity, gets us over eight and a half that we need in 10 years. So next 10 years is gonna be busy. Remember I told you, $3.27 billion in projects. That's what all this stuff is, to make sure that we can handle the growth that the Southeast United States comes into play. I thought I'd throw this one here because you guys might find this kind of interesting. So ocean terminals down on the bottom. The Savannah River is 17 miles down out to Tybee. So as we mentioned earlier, we don't want ships sitting outside Tybee. We don't, we, they need to get in here, but 17 miles to make their way up, it takes two and a half, three hours for that vessel to come in. So currently the port owns this property on the other side of Ocean Terminal. Someday that'll be another container terminal. But we think the best way for the use of property from a berth perspective is basically construct three ship parking spaces. We call them lay berths. So what happens is, there's a vessel being operated in Garden City Terminal. It gets done, it makes its way down the river. 
These ships have been parked waiting. Instead of waiting 17 miles and four and a half hours to come up the river, they're waiting at a lay berth. Whoop, they go right up into Garden City Terminal and they start operating. The construction of these three berth parking spaces gives us another million TEUs of capacity of berth capacity because it utilizes time better. You can't be wasting time having that vessel go up four and a half hours when a berth is open. You want to allow that to take place at night or whatever, whenever, and have them park there and wait. When one's ready and open, get, go in there very quickly. Allows us to turn ships quicker, and that increases our capacity. So it gives you an idea of where we need to go for the future for us to continue to increase our capacity. So that's, that's what it's all about at the GPA. Get our stuff in and out of our facilities as quickly as possible. Have the proper infrastructure to be able to do that and then allow our businesses to continue to grow as we grow uh, in the years to come. Are there any questions on what I just went over from, from a GPA? I, I threw a lot at you, a lot of numbers, but at the end of the day, it's all about capacity. Yes, sir? Do you have any boxes? We do not. So those boxes, those containers, are owned by the shipping lines. So when those boxes, so that vessel that you saw, the CGMA, they have their own boxes. They'll they bring them over to China, they'll fill them up with uh, TVs, and then boxes come in, and they're basically, they, uh, they monitor those boxes, that's their property, and then in they come, in, and they go out to Best Buy, unload it, and come back out, and it's called an empty. Now it's empty, and that empty container is either gonna get filled up with USA stuff, or it's gonna get put back on a ship and go back to China empty. But I'll make one, one point about that. Georgia is a very resource-rich state, which is very, very lucky. Almost 50% of our imports and 50% exports takes place at GPA. So in other words, we import as much as we export. Of course, we've got clay materials, we've got wood products, wood, uh, uh, peanut products, all sorts of facilities, logs even. We even put logs in these containers and send them out all over the world. So it's almost a 50-50. I will tell you this, there are, Currently, today, um, when all those imports came in, with all the stuff that we all, the COVID stuff we bought, all that stuff makes its way out, eventually gets to the shelves, those boxes come back to the port, we have sometimes 30 to 40,000 empty boxes sitting on the terminal waiting to go onto a ship or be filled up with Georgia stuff before it heads out. So that requires space. So here we are in Atlanta, huge Huge demand for capacity for, for cargo. My son, is uh, he, he's here in Atlanta going to school. He has an apartment at the end of the Beltline, which is off of DeKalb. Is that how you pronounce it? DeKalb at the end over there by I-20. So on the other side, there's a Halsey rail yard. If you go over there today, take a look over and take a look what you're going to see. We rented that property containers in there now from GPA. We moved containers from Savannah, got them off our terminal. They're currently, we got about 2,000 boxes in the Halsey yard here in Atlanta waiting to head out because we are able to do these things to lease property, get the boxes in, and the folks that are here in Atlanta are happy. They got their boxes here. They can get them to their facilities easier. It's called a pop-up yard. You might have heard, if you, if you read some of that, uh, some maritime stuff, we've got pop-up yards here in Atlanta, we, uh, we took over some of the, uh, an airstrip in Statesboro, Georgia. There's about a thousand boxes there. So we move boxes to locations to get them off the terminal quicker. It gives us more capacity. So it's a good question about the boxes and that's what happens, what takes place at. Yes, sir. Can you give a brief understanding of how they track all of those containers? Yes. So every box, I don't have a picture of it, um, but every box has got a number. So it's, it's not an RFID tag. Um, but when they come through our gates, the truck comes through. The first, there's a, it's a three-stage gate. So there's a photograph that's taken of that box, and it reads the number on the box. Then that number is matched up to the manifest that they submitted to us, so we know what's in that box. And then we provide the IT. Remember I told you how many IT people we have? They provide the documentation of where that box needs to go into the yard and then when a crane needs to pick it up and put it onto a ship. So it's all about that numbering system on that box. 
If you look at it in a 40 foot container, anywhere when you're out here on, uh, out on in your highways here in Georgia, look on the back of it, you'll see there's a number. That is what tracks those containers. Every one of those containers has got a tracking number. And that's how we follow it and keep an eye on it. And our IT infrastructure is what can, follows it. And we know where it has been and where it's going by tracking that number. Yes, yep, every number is all set up on it. Yep, yes ma'am. No question is dumb. Excuse me? Oh, they can go, oh, uh, the, the Panama Canal? Oh, the, oh, the pipe makers, I mean, uh, the Savannah River. The Savannah River is 17 miles wide. There are is it three spots? I think there's three passing zones that two vessels can pass. So the pilots have to coordinate where they can, when they can get to the passing zone and the two of them, because these vessels are over 170 feet wide. Now, the Federal Channel is 500. So these two guys are passing by each other pretty darn close. But the entire river is not, does not allow for full passing. There are certain passing zones in the river. Isaac knows I, I make him simulate the river. But there's different locations where they can pass. Yes, sir. And I, I love talking to engineers. You guys talk, always have the best questions. Okay, so here's the story with the river. So uh, there's a couple of things that are lucky about the river. Um, we just finished dredging the river down to minus 47. Now, that's 47 feet at low tide. There is a seven foot to eight foot tide differential on Savannah River. So you could have 47 feet or 55 feet of water. That's crucial because when these vessels come in loaded with all of our stuff, we know the weight, of course. We know the draft of that vessel. So we know that we take every month that river gets surveyed. So we know the depth, if there's been any shoaling or anything like that. And when that vessel makes its way up, we know it's its exact draft. So when we don't want it to come in at high tide and then low tide comes and it ends up sitting, a squat. So there's the, our, our harbor master people calculate and determine when that vessel should make itself up the river. And it's a, it can get very, very uh, elementary at times. I mean, our, our harbor master guy by the name of Chris Rice, very smart guy, uh, drinks a lot of Mountain Dew. You got to when you're dealing with this kind of stuff. He, handle, he understands where that vessel is and, and the draft that it takes. So when it comes to the berth, Let's say you take out 2,000 boxes, and then you put another 200 back on. That modifies the ballast. So a lot of times it changes the ballast, and that ca ship captain is responsible for modifying the ballast. You all heard about the Golden Ray down in Brunswick? The one that went <coughs> Let me give you a little bit of in insight on that. Um, I'm not going too late. Gosh, I'm getting, uh, I can stand up here all day and talk about this stuff. But anyways, the, the Golden Ray came into our Brunswick port there were 4,000 vehicles on that beast. She let off about 250 of them. When they brought it, when they left, I don't know if they modified the val ballasting or they didn't turn some valves properly, but when she started making her way out and she made that left turn, she didn't like that turn. That pilot, he worked, he was unbelievable. When that vessel was turned over, it took about 20 seconds to flip over. So when it was flipping over, he knew to turn that, sh move that ship. Because once it turned, once it started flipping, the props are gone. You've lost all control. He knew before it started going to a certain point to steer it out of the channel. And he, he basically grounded it into the, uh, 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 adjacent to the, to the channel. And because it got grounded into the mud, it didn't flood. It saved the lives in the, in the engine room. There are a couple of guys in the engine room that were trapped there for three, four days. How'd you like to be in there in the dark? Those cars were on fire. You got a little bit of gas in there, plus the batteries. Batteries are nasty. And it caused a little bit of a smoke, a fire in there. It was very, very scary. But that pilot was a hero. To be able to know to do that, to get it over. And then, of course, it took two and a half years to cut that thing up and get it out. 4,000 cars, over 2 billion. The vessel itself is 400 million, 
4,000 cars is probably, I don't know, a, mil a billion. And then you got to pay the contractor to do, I mean, it's probably two to $3 billion just for that one, one vessel. So it gives you an idea of the money and the risk associated with the maritime business that we have to deal with on some of our, some of our uh, uh, vessels. Any other questions? Yes, sir. We know, uh, we know the, the planning of every vessel, we know uh, with, certainly within six weeks, it's basically a six week circuit. So we know when they're supposed to arrive. A lot of them, are, believe, they don't come on time. They try, uh, but there's extenuating circumstances that take place. Let's, let's say, put it this way, a vessel that's gonna come to Savannah, but let's say it goes to New York and Virginia first and they're stuck in that queue with 40 vessels. <laughs> that's gonna hurt us. So maybe they're gonna come to Savannah first before they go up to there. So they've been doing all of that kind of stuff as well. Um, but we know where they are. We know their manifest. We know every six weeks the turnover of when those vessels are supposed to show. And uh, we have a monthly and daily uh, log of when, when they're supposed to come. And then we match up the timing with the tides based on the drafts of when that vessel can make itself up the river. Yes, sir. How much automation do you have for your container moving? Oh. Automation is a very bad word. Mm. Good question, though. Let me tell you why it's frowned upon. We have ILA labor that uh, moves, moves the boxes from the ship to the container. They're great people. These people work. They're unbelievable with how they have to work. And their jobs, very, very good paying jobs. And they are an integral part of what we do at our facility. On the east coast of the US, the, the labor with the ILA is spectacular. There's no automation. Very, very little automation. Um, the west coast, they have some, but there's a lot of pushback uh, on it. Unlike other ports in the world, I've been many ports in the world, where there is full automation. They come off of a vessel, it goes into the ship, the truck with no driver, and off it goes. That's a long way away here in the U.S. because of because of our labor and our jobs, uh, very very important jobs. Be, you know, let's put it this way: Remember how I mentioned 35 boxes an hour on a ship to shore crane? That requires some good hard-earned grit labor. I I can guarantee you, automation would never get 35 boxes an hour. Won't happen. That reduces the capacity. You know how I feel about reduction of capacity. <laughs> So we work hand in hand with our ILA folks in our, in, our, in our labor. Whenever they need something, they come to me, they come to Isaac, or we build it, we get it done because their job, rain or shine, cold or hot, they're out there unloading those vessels. And that's a huge component. They are unsung heroes. And, uh, and I appreciate the question about automation, but I think it's uh, a long way away from on the East Coast of the US. Yes, sir. Can you Ah, I, I, that's a good question. So, um, we don't have any press here, do we? <laughs> I was in Charleston yeah, about a month or two ago, and I said something and ended up in their paper, and that was bad. But uh, in, in any event, so, well, let's talk about the first top three. So, L.A., Long Beach are number one and two. Huge. Those guys together, to, to, uh, combined, they're like 20 million TEUs. Okay, huge numbers. New York, New Jersey is number three. They are, I think, at about eight. So we're, at, we're about five and a half, six. We're six. Um, New York, New Jersey does not have the expansion capabilities that we have. So I am, I may not look it, but I'm 56, okay? <laughs> uh, I got another 10 years, 11 years of work. I was born in New Jersey, grew up in the South, before I retire, we will pass New York, New Jersey. We will. It's, I'm a southerner. I don't sound like a southerner, but I grew up here in the south, went to Miami. You guys heard a lot. But at the end of the day, we will surpass them because the southeast is, is huge in its growth. Um, and that's what we're planning for. Now, I only showed you the first 10 years of growth. Okay. So when I did that exercise, I had to got, not go to 2032. I went to 2050. So in 2050, I'll be 85. I'll be done working by then, but we will be, we will be approaching LA Long Beach at that time. 
York will be in our rearview mirror, in my opinion. But that's the goal. I'm, I'm very aggressive, as I'm sure you can tell. Isaac, I'm aggressive, right? I'm a little aggressive. And, uh, and if we have to be, to be, to be where we are, to be able to handle what we do. Did you have a question? Yes, sir. Uh, I'm 82. Uh, do you have to handle any passengers? Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> You heard in the you heard in the uh, in the introduction. I was at Port Everglades for for about 15 years, and I built cruise terminals and the largest cruise ships in the world went there. Here's the problem with passengers: they have bags. Those bags, they go on these week cruises and they got bags and bags and bags, and the people complain in the bags, and, they, and you got to get them in and out very very quickly. Will that happen, in Savannah? Highly unlikely. Me being from the cruise side, I can tell you why. Number one, we had some fog, not a lot of fog. Eh, February is usually our fog month. The cruise ships don't like to drive up 17 miles and then load their junk and then go 17 miles to go down to the Bahamas. They like those Florida ports. Now, Charleston's got a cruise, port, uh, got a cruise, cruise line up there. They're a little closer to the Atlantic. They can take the cruise passengers. We'll take all their containers. Oh, I didn't say that. Um, uh, but you have Paul. Passenger containers. Can you elaborate on that? You mean cars? Well, you have a, what is it, a 50-foot container, and it's outfitted on the inside to handle a couple of families who are taking cruise ships, and maybe you want to use the rail lines in the U.S., maybe the truck lines in the U.S., and they've got a passenger container. Holy moly, that's innovative. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, well, the short answer to that is no, we don't have that. Um, but uh, yeah, that's, uh, that'd be, that would be, that would be, like, man, that'd be like you'd be a nomad on, in your box and just drive her wherever you want, kind of cool. But no, we don't have anything like that. From a rail perspective, it's all containers. But uh, uh, you can understand why the pa cruise passengers and cruising at the Port of Savannah just really doesn't mix because of their business model is more for the South Florida uh, down there in Canaveral. Savannah's a little different. Any other questions? Oh, one more. I was about ready to get thrown off the stage. Yes, sir. All right, let's take care of part A first. So, of the 6 million TUs of capacity, about 20% goes out on rail. The other 80% is truck. Will that change over the years? Maybe. Um, depends on, the, the, there's, right now there's a shortage of truckers. Um, that's why we've invested so much in rail. I expect that 20% to probably get to 25% as we continue to pro provide more and more containers out, uh, out in via rail. Um, airport facilities, um, let's put it this way. That ship that you saw in the beginning, it has probably 10,000 boxes on it. Just that one ship, okay? And to move a, a box from China to Georgia, it's about, don't hold me to it, about 4,000 bucks, okay, for one box. So there's 10,000 boxes on there. These companies have mass amount of cargo that goes on these ships. How many cargo containers do you think they can put on a 747? Not a lot. Three, four, where I got 10,000 on a ship? Air cargo, it's a whole different model compared to ship to maritime more cargo. Most people don't realize that how much cargo moves over the ocean through these vessels. And the fleet that's out there moving this cargo 
with these largest container companies in the world. America is a huge user. We use a lot of stuff. That's why we are the way we are. It's our society. And we've developed in that fashion. We don't see it changing anytime soon. And an airport model could never, ever keep up with our demand. We require a lot of stuff. Companies like Amazon, Walmart, Target, they're able to get all of that stuff and they're able to get it on those ships and get them here and put pressure on guys like me and Isaac to get stuff done so that we can enjoy our society as we, as we enjoy. And without the, the maritime business and the logistics that takes place, we wouldn't be able to function the way we are. So it's just one component of the big picture of, of how we live. But you saw in this past year or so what happens when the supply chain takes a hit. Panic in the streets, shelves are empty, my wife can't go and get her Coke Zero at Publix. I don't know why Coke Zero is made here. I don't know why that was empty in the shelves. But these are the things that we are demand, Americans demand. And that's why we make sure that we've got the facilities to handle the demand. Any other questions? You guys have been great. I, I, I really appreciate it. It's, it's, been, it's, it's a pleasure talking about GPA to you guys.